Today, we are delighted to welcome Tim Cox, um, Chairman of the Executive Committee of the British Sporting Arts Trust. Tim will today give us a detailed talk exploring the history of racehorse portraiture and what these pictures can tell us about the development of racing over the centuries. Tim has been Executive Chairman of the British Sporting Arts Trust for over 10 years and on the committee for um, over 20 years. Um, Tim's successful career as an advertising agency director spanned more than 40 years. And alongside his career, he has created a private library called the Cox Library. His love of the thoroughbred horse in all its forms, including breeding and racing, began in 1970 when he was inspired by a long, lifelong friend, Peter Jones, the then chairman of the Tote, who took him on a trip to Ascot to see the King George VI and Queen Elizabeth stakes. His library is a private library, custom built to hold his now collection of about 18,000 books. The first book of which he bought was Sir George Chetwin's Racing Reminiscences and Experiences of the Turf which he bought in a bookshop in Lyme Regis in 1975. Tim himself is described as a highly respectable historian of the thoroughbred breed and his collection as a remarkable collection without equal in Britain. He has written countless articles for magazines and essays for the British Sporting Arts Trust publications. He is also co-author of The Heath and the Horse, which was published in 2015, which is the first book to trace the history of Newmarket Heath from its beginnings to the present day. Tim's voluntary contribution to the British Sporting Arts Trust is exemplary, as is his dedication to the museum. And I know he'll kill me for saying that, but I've said it. Um, if you have any questions for Tim, please type them in the questions and answers box, which I think is at the bottom of this page, and we will endeavour to answer as many as we have time for. And I will now pass you over to Tim. Sally has just told you about the next lecture, and I think that's it. Thank you, Tim. Uh, thank you very much, Caroline, and uh, welcome to everybody. Um, Caroline's gone way beyond her brief in describing my career, um, but thank you. Um, it was much appreciated. Uh, when we were preparing the National Horse Racing Museum for its opening on its new site in 2016, one of the team asked, what are we going to do about all these horse portraits? They all look the same. Most of them are brown and most of them are facing left. What do we say about them? How can we possibly make them interesting? What I want to do today is to make a case for these so-called boring horse portraits. They are the reason why I joined the BSAT in the early 1980s. As Caroline said in her introduction, I built up a library of over 18,000 books on the history and thorough, on thoroughbred racing, both and breeding uh, worldwide. I saw these horse portraits as an important historical document containing details that are not picked up in the usual racing histories. However, this has led on to more detective work into these pictures, often identifying horses that have disappeared and reappeared in auctioneers' catalogues as brown horse looking left with jockey up. I spent much of the lockdown in the 18th century helping two art historians, and very cosy it was too, although I suspect the reality of life in the 18th century would have been very different from my family. The first was Richard Wills and his catalogue resume on James Seymour, uh, which was published last November. Here we see the front cover image. And the second was Karen Hladik, uh, in the US who has taken up the formidable task of researching the racing pictures and portraits of John Wooden. I hope her book will come out in the next year or two. A major study of Wooden's work is long overdue. Uh, we have to go back to 1984 and this uh, exhibition at Kenwood House and the catalogue written by Arlene Mayer for something on Wooden. 
not all the work has been done in isolation. We have the considerable support of my fellow researchers, David Aldry, who's been studying these pictures for many, many years. Uh, and you'll see throughout the talk that he is adding a lot of the detail to what we see. And Richard Nash, whose work is obscure British archives, has unearthed many details that have been overlooked by other historians. There are hundreds of painted portraits and thousands when we get to the age of photography. So I've had to be a bit selective. The first thing to say is that most racehorse portraits have been commissioned by their owners. And for the most part, they have been painted at the size which is suitable for de a domestic setting. Although to be fair, some homes are slightly bigger than others. Right from the beginning, champion racehorses have been memorialized in paint. When we wanted to illustrate the long history of racing on Newmarket Heath for our book, The Heath and the Horse, which uh, Caroline mentioned, we chose Flying Childers uh, for the front cover and Frankel for the back. These were the first and latest champions to be trained and raced on Newmarket Heath. Uh, here we have Flying Childers by James Seymour, which hangs at Chatsworth in the collection of the Duke of Devonshire. He ran four times as Childers in two races and two trials, but his performances were so outstanding that they added the sobriquet flying uh, to his name. Somebody claimed that he could run at a mile a minute. Uh, I think that's a bit far-fetched uh, to think of a horse running at 60 miles an hour. But if we do the sums, he did run his four mile races at the same speed as an Ascot Gold Cup winner does over two and a half miles today. In the background, we see Childers uh, beating Lord Droider's Chaunter on 23rd of October, 1722 on Newmarket Heath. The latest cha champion, Frankel, was trained at Newmarket by Henry Cecil. This painting is by Charles Church, who has painted 80 Group 1 winners in his career to date, and I'm sure there will be many, many more. Frankel raced 13 times, sorry, 14 times across three seasons and remained unbeaten. He was most spectacular win was in the 2000 Guineas at the Newmarket, which he won at by six lengths. He retired as the highest rated racehorse in the world and is now building a fantastic stud career at Banstead Manor Stud for Judmont. His offspring include Alpinista, who won last year's pre de de Triumph for Kirsten Rousing and was trained by Sir Mark Prescott. So that is roughly the period of racehorse portraiture that we're talking about. In total, it is 340 years, give or take a bit. This is the portrait of Stubbs, uh, sorry, of Eclipse. Little did George Stubbs know that when he painted Eclipse that he would become one of the most influential horses in the future of the thoroughbred breed. Here we see his jockey, Sam Marriott, preparing to mount on, at the four mile stable at Newmarket. He won 18 races and was unbeaten, about uh, eight of them were walkovers. 95% of the thoroughbreds in the world today trace back to Eclipse. J.F. Herring Senior painted many portraits of classic winners, uh, including a set of Derby winners that were produced as prints. But can a portrait of a racehorse be so feminine as this portrait of Matilda, who won the St. Ledger in 1827, seen here with her jockey, James Robinson? Aldry in his catalogue of the Jockey Club collection quotes from a poem, snorting and prancing, sidling by with arching neck and glancing eye. Matilda's victory in the St. Ledger had been seen as a great triumph for the North against the South. The poetic words and Herring's portrait do her justice. We then move on to Ormond, which is one of the greatest racehorses of all time. He won all 16 of his races, including the 1886 Derby. In this painting uh, by the German Emil Adam, we see him with his jockey Fred Archer, who was the champion jockey 13 times up until 1886, and his trainer John Porter, who won the Derby seven times. Ormond is one of the 14 portraits by Emil Adam 
on display in the dining room at the Jockey Club rooms. This has been described as a rather spectacular Hall of Fame, I think an understatement. It is worth noting that Adam was working in an age of photography, so his portraits can, can be compared with the photo photographic image. This becomes the time when paintings are competing directly with the reality of the camera. Adam comes well out of that comparison. A few years ago, uh, I bought the correspondence between the artist Linwood Palmer and one of his best patrons, the 17th Earl of Derby. My first reaction was to take an instant delight, dislike to the 17th Earl because of the way he criticized the work of Palmer which was in quite harsh terms, and the abrupt language that he used in his letters. I suspect it was my need for a more respectful language to be used that coloured my judgment. However, I changed my view after working on the letters for some time. In the end, I knew that both men were trying to get the best, most truthful portrait of a horse that they could. Palmer had had veterinary training, was an expert on the care of horses' legs. Much of the correspondence concentrated on the legs of the horses that were being painted and getting them right. But the relationship uh, did survive after Palmer returned from France with a portrait of one of Derby's horses that was staying at stud in Paris, only to be told that he'd come back having painted the wrong horse. This is not one of Derby's horses, this is St. Simon, owned by the sixth Duke of Portland at the time. St. Simon's racing career was curtailed by the death of his breeder and owner, Prince Bathiani. The rule at the time was that entries for classic races were voided by the death of the owner. However, St. Simon did win nine races, won a walkover, including the Ascot Gold Cup as a three-year-old by 20 lengths. He was never seriously challenged on the race course and he was a champion sire from 1890 to 1901. Bringing ourselves up to date to more modern times, it's, this is uh, Sun Chariot uh, by Sir Alfred Munnings painted in 1942. Sun Chariot won uh, the Thousand Guineas, the Oats and Sir Ledger all run at Newmarket at the time. She ran in the colors of King George VI being leased to him from her racing career by the National Stud. Sir Alfred off, uh, is often portrayed as a reactionary. That might be true in his old age, but in his painting career was certainly revolutionary. He launched his career at the time when Emil Adam, the picture we saw earlier, was producing rather photographic portraits. Munnings introduced some of the freedom of expression inherited from the French Impressionists of the late 19th century. He spent many of his later years on Newmarket Heath using the last remaining rubbing house by the Cambridgeshire Start as his studio. And in this section, this is the last uh, picture. Uh, this is of Enable by Charles Church, painted soon after she retired. Here she is seen with a jockey Frankie de Tory and trainer John Gosden. She won the King George VI and Queen Elizabeth Stakes three times, 2017, 19 and 20, and the Prix de l'Arc de Triomphe uh, twice in 2017 and 18. Charles Church is emerging, or should I say has emerged, as the leading portraitist of racehorses in our times, and is a worthy successor to Stubbs and Munnings. Those were a series of champions that have been portrayed in paint, but sometimes the painting is better than the horse portrayed. Here uh, we have Andrew by Ben Marshall from the Jockey Club collection. Andrew was by a St. Ledger winner out of an Oaks winner. He had a good start to life, you might think, but he won only a few small races and then broke down. He ended up as a traveling stallion at five guineas and a service. He only produced one winner, though it was quite a good winner in Cadland, who had won, who did win the 2000 guineas and the derby for the Duke of Rutland. I think this painting reminds us that the paintings of racehorses are primarily produced for the owners, and the owners have many, many reasons to celebrate their horses, not just for the winning of big races.
it's obviously important to celebrate our champions and to have a record of what they look like. But I'm drawn to these portraits for other reasons, particularly the early portraits. What can they tell us about racing that is different from our practice today? This portrait hangs in the National Horse Racing Museum. I believe that it is Black Legs, painted by John Baptiste Klosterman, who painted a number of portraits for the Duke of Portland, who owned the horse. We see Beaver Castle high on the hill to the left. I believe the course is Saltby, uh, so we're looking north from the south of the castle. The jockey is wearing the all blue colours of the Duke, trousers, jacket and cap, all in the same colour. This was the standard uniform for jockeys up to about nine, uh, 1725, when the jacket and cap alone became the distinguishing colours for each owner, just as it is today. Seeing jockeys dressed like this in paintings uh, is a good way of dating a painting. And there are other differences. Uh, the course is marked out by flags, you can see in the distance, no rails to keep the runners on the course. And the trophy for the race, I hope you can see it just there, uh, is placed on the finishing post, uh, is slightly uh, faint uh, in the picture. But what is the hare doing there? Has that been noticed by our visitors at the museum? We have done research to see there is, whether there's any heraldic importance in the hare with a possible link to the Rutlands. Perhaps it just means that Saltby was famous for its hares, but it's a question that still needs an answer. I've included this picture uh, by John Wharton because it shows another aspect of racing in these early times. The painting is a grey mare which hangs at Boodle's Club in London. You will see that not only was the trophy put aloft on the finishing post, just as we saw before, but that, there were the, but that was where the jockeys were weighed before and after each race. You can see the, uh, the scales uh, on the post. It also allows me to say something about Wooden. Wooden was a prolific painter of racehorses and stallions. Karen Haddock has likened his studio to a factory. This makes it difficult to tell whether his paintings, even those signed by him, are truly by him or by his studio. That's the challenge that Karen has taken on in uh, writing uh, a book about the, his racehorse portraits. At the time when Wooden was, amongst others, was churning out uh, his paintings, a print industry was evolving. So we have an important coming together of three elements which contribute to the development of the genre of the art that becomes known as sporting art. We have the development of the horse being used as a competitive animal with strong elements of entertainment. This leads to the breeding of faster horses and the importation of Arab horses and other Eastern horses to improve the competitiveness of the race horses, which eventually leads to the breed of the thoroughbred. Secondly, we have owners that want to memorialize their horses and artists to satisfy that demand. And thirdly, we have the growth of printmakers who can produce hundreds of images, which can be bought by many and which decorate the walls beyond the confines of the owner's private home. We can see the prints as a way of popularizing the sport. This print of Bajazet is from a series of prints produced by John Cheney and Thomas Butler from in images painted by Butler and others. We are lucky that a set of these prints has just been donated to the trust by Karen Pladdick. These prints are important because they not only give us an image of the horse, however primitive it might seem to be, but this set also gives us the breeding and racing record of the horses at a time when this information was not readily available. Jan Vick, Wooten, Tillemans, James Seymour, Thomas Spencer all produced racehorse portraits. But it was not until George Stubbs that we can be confident that the horse that we're seeing looked like the horse in real life. Stubbs devoted 10 years to dissecting horses to understand their physical structure, drawing them at various stages as he cut deeper and deeper. He then learned how to engrave his drawings and eventually published The Anatomy of a Horse in 1766. 
This was both an artistic and a scientific endeavor. By the end, you believe that Stubbs can commit to canvas a truly living, breathing horse. And perhaps the best, certainly the most recognizable, is Whistle Jacket. This is certainly a painting that far outstrips the importance of the horse as a racehorse or a contributor to the breed. The horse came to Lock Lord Rockingham at Wentworth Woodhouse when he, the horse, was 10 years old. His gracing career was moderate, but Rockingham and Stubbs saw the quintessential example of the thoroughbred. Here we see him on the Vard, facing his audience. We see how the racehorse had developed from the coarse, heavy-bodied example that Klosterman painted for the Duke of Rutland to this beautiful specimen with Arab blood coursing through his veins. But Stubbs was not always right. Uh, his, this painting of Scrub, done at the same time as Whistle Jacket, was rejected by Lord Rockingham. It is almost the same size as Whistle Jacket, about 10 feet tall. No reason is given for the reaction or the rejection, although it is easy to see that it doesn't match the majesty of Whistle Jacket. Stubbs sold it to a dealer who bundled it up and sent it out to India on a speculative basis. The carrier ship couldn't land and it came back to England a little worse for wear. It was returned to Stubbs and sold in his studio sale uh, of 1807. It's now owned by Lord Halifax. It is in this painting though, that I found the most excitement and really uh, developed my interest in horse portraiture. It was catalogued as a chestnut horse by George Stubbs. Nothing more was known about it until David Aldry did his detective work. Having nothing more than the painting to go on and an indistinct date of 1786, which horse was it? David identified the location as Oxcroft Farm, which is just outside uh, Newmarket. Stubbs had used that location for earlier portraits, including this of Sweetbriar in 1779, but there was a significant difference. The trees on the left had grown bushier and that, than those in the earlier picture. So we can see the trees as they were in 1779, and then as they become in 17. 90 or say 10 years later. So we have a later picture, perhaps 10 years later, at Oxcroft Farm. Oxcroft was where Lord Grosvenor kept his stud and it turns out that Alexander was the only chestnut stallion standing at Oxcroft in 1790. Alexander is now on display at Palace House Newmarket, having been properly identified now and brought back to life. More detective work was required for this picture. It hangs at Waddesdon Manor and has been in the Rothschild collection since the 1920s. It's not on the usual uh, visitor route. It's hanging above a door uh, leading into the library. We know it's a horse called Swallow because that's on the painting. To the left, you see. The groom is William Miller. That's also on the painting. But the first challenge was to unravel its catalogue entry, which was Swallow, held by William Miller, groom to Sir T.S. Bonnet. Who was Sir T.S. Bonnet? And it's here that Karen Fladdick uh, solved the mystery. It eventually turned out to be a misreading of a note on the back of the picture. It should be read as Sir Thomas Samwell, Sir T.S., Baronet, not Bonnet. So Thomas lived at Upton near Northampton, but that really didn't get us very far. Then we found a reference to Swallow in the Winchenden stud book of Lord Wanton. This is one of the very earliest uh, stud books from about the 1780s, uh, 1680s. Wharton was a very influential racing man of the late 17th century, we believe we have identified the first racehorse portrait produced in this country. The horse was important because King Charles II offered 300 pounds for him. But this is still work in progress. 
just as we saw in the early paintings of Childers by Seymour and the Grey Mare by Wharton, there is a race going on in the middle distance, which I've uh, uh, enlarged. Not only is this the uh, first race of its kind going on in the middle distance, uh, it's also the first racehorse portrait. I have to admit I was a bit lazy when I assumed the chestnut horse that we saw in the portrait, Swallow, was winning the race and thought no more about it until it was pointed out that it is a bay horse with a rider in yellow ahead of a grey horse with a rider in dark blue. The subject of the picture of the chestnut horse is third, so that's something we have to explain. But what more did we learn? Where is the race being run? We had to identify the big house in the distance. It's here my fellow author Richard Nash led us to a picture of Winchendon produced by Peter Tillemans in about 1708. I think we can safely say that the house is the grand house built for the Whartons, which was pulled down in the 1750s. But you may have spotted a church in the picture. Where's this church located? It seems to have uh, features that are easily identifiable, but we can't find it yet. Uh, or has it been pulled down as well as the house? For the time being, I believe the race is being run at Quainton, the race course established by Thomas Wharton, and the location of the important uh, nobleman and gentleman estates, which was later transferred to Newmarket. And you will see a lot of pictures of the nobleman and gentleman estates painted by Wharton. Uh, in various collections around the country. If that is correct, the race is being run about four miles from Wadders Manor, where the picture now hangs. So for whatever reason, the picture is at Wadden, Waddesdon. Uh, it has returned to within four miles of uh, the location of the race being portrayed. Sometimes the picture is not what we see immediately. The first impression of this picture is of a horse being rubbed down immediately after a race that we see in the middle distance. Well, not quite. This is one of the best, if not the best, in the Jockey Club rooms. There are three versions of this painting, one of which was sold at Christie's for over 20 million pounds in 2012. The portrait is of Jim Crack by George Stubbs. Jim Crack won 25 of his 35 races in this country, but there had been a brief interlude during that career when he was racing in France. He was described by Lady Bunbury as that sweetest little horse. He is delightful. The real interest in this painting though, lies in what is going on in the middle distance. The scene is set at the finish of the Beacon course. Uh, I'll go back. We see um, uh, the king's stand on the far side of the course and the king's rubbing house on our side. The significant fact is that these shutters uh, are closed uh, on the king's stand. We are watching a trial because in those days spectators were banned from the heath when the course was being booked for a trial. The other fact that confirms that this is a race is that in those days, by act of parliament, no owner could own more than two horses in a race, and the orange colours of the third and fourth horses suggest the same ownership. We can even suggest a date for this trial. It's 8th of May, 1765, and that's the result of detective work. And the horses in the trial, well, Jim Crack is winning, Richard Vernon's Cheshire Dick, second in the white colours, and Lord Rogovna's Boreas and Cardinal Puff in third and fourth. These were horses preparing for important races that were coming up and where the owners would benefit from a bit of inside knowledge as to how to bet. This forensic uh, work was done by David Aldry. Here's another picture of the chestnut horse by George Stubbs, which was exhibited in 1957 as horse with jockey up. Again, we rely on David to help us. The location is the judge's box on the round course 
now the July course at Newmarket. Conductor is the only chestnut horse that won at that meeting. It was the King's Plate on the 13th of April, 1773. And this is all confirmed by the light blue colors of Lord Farnham. So far, so good. But we can go further. What about the large peak of the jockey's cap worn at an angle? The jockey is Jack Clark. In the memoirs of Thomas Holcroft, a late 18th century actor who had been a stable lad earlier in his life, we read the rather gruesome tale. Some stable lads were fooling about when playfully one of them pulled a gun and shouted, I'll shoot you, Jack. He thought the gun was uh, not loaded. As Holroy says, and the says, the left eye was lost, the appearance of the bones was disfigured, and the deep stain of gunpowder remained. Jack Clark was the lad. And now we know why the peak of the cap had been pulled down. It was to hide Jack's disfigurement. And there are telltale signs that the artist was not at the race meeting. This is another painting by Stubbs. It is Hambletonian, which hangs at Mount Stuart in Northern Ireland. This is the last of the pictures of 61 racehorses painted by Stubbs many more than once and comes towards the end of his life. It shows Hambletonian being rubbed down after a close fought match against Diamond for £3,000, roughly equivalent to £400,000 in today's money. It was the richest race run by in Newmarket in 1799. It was billed as a North v South battle, which attracted great interest. The newspaper reports that a great crowd was drawn to Newmarket, such that there was no bed or stable to be had for any money in Newmarket or the surrounding area. Hambletonian won, but it was one of the roughest races with a vivid description in the sporting magazine. The horses were much whipped and spurred according to our blasted sap skull Cherokee English custom, about 40 times as much as this was either necessary or advantageous. But if we look at Hamiltonian, although Stubbs has tried to uh, capture the exhaustion of the horse, there's absolutely no mark to be seen. Uh, perhaps Stubbs was reflecting the general clamour at the time for the better treatment of racehorses uh, and therefore didn't want to glorify or draw attention to the inju injuries. Or simply Stubbs wasn't there. And I think that is the case. Almost immediately after the race, Shambletonian was shipped down to London. His wounds had obviously healed before Stubbs painted him in his Covent Garden studio. We know that the landscape was added uh, later. It's based on a picture produced by Stubbs in the 1760s. This picture also contains other clues that Stubbs was not at the races. This picture also contains uh, the wind, for example, the window shutters uh, uh, should be what brown, not white at this time. And the course had been reconfigured. I'm not surprised that uh, Stubbs was not at the races. He would be in the 70s at, at the time. And also Stubbs didn't include any of the course, the vast crowd that had attended the races, but other artists uh, have included them when they uh, show us the race. Stubbs had produced a great painting of Hamiltonian, the last great painting of his career, but there was a sad ending or poignant ending. So Harry Vane Tempest, the owner, refused to pay for the picture. We don't know why, uh, and the details in the court case uh, have been lost, but Stubbs had to take him to court to force him to pay the £300 bill. And sometimes the picture carries a title, but the title is wrong. This picture is by Francis Sartorius, and it hangs in the jockey club and was thought to be, by, to be Sir Charles Bunbury's Diomed. Now Diomed is a, 
uh, important horse. He was a short price favorite for the first running of the Derby and won. But he wasn't a great success at stud. So at the age of 20, he was shipped off to America where his fortunes changed. He was the forefather of many of the best horses, including the great horse Lexington, who was a champion sire 14 times. The owner's colors were right for Sir Charles, but we know from other evidence that the markings on the horse are not correct. So we need a painting of Diamond because of his, the significance of his winning the, the first derby and being a success in America, but we haven't got the right portrait. Uh, the title continues to be used by the Jockey Club until uh, we can find another uh, uh, reason for the horse uh, being what it is, uh, being identified. Here's a portrait uh, of Diomed painted in America. Uh, you will see only a little white above his near hind hoof, uh, which confirms other portraits that we have in England. So the Jockey Club has a painting of one of Sir Charles Bunbury's horses, but to date it has not been identified. Kate Green, when she was writing about the British Sporting Art Trust uh, in Country Life last year in July, uh, wrote these works that evoke happy memories and the feeling of longing and nostalgia, as well as admiration for the nobility of animals. Most of the pictures stand in their own right, as celebrations of horses painted for their owners to provide happy memories. Many now are on public display. They are a good record of how horses and painting skills have developed over the years. But for me, and that's the reason I'm inter more interested in these portraits, there is even more in these paintings than meets the immediate glance. It's those stories that are worth unraveling, provided you've got the time and a good guide, which I have had, to direct that research. So thank you. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, Tim, I have, thank you very much, Tim. Um, I have um, a couple of questions that come in. Um, the first one is, how accurate do you think these race horse portraits are? Um, I think uh, I think we have to be honest that the very early portraits um, are probably not the best. Uh, and people who know horses uh, often tell me that those horses couldn't run uh, a, a yard. Uh, they're too straight in front or the bone structure isn't good for a racehorse. Uh, I think we have to wait until uh, stubs before we start to see a proper representation of a racehorse. But I think those early portraits do get the markings right. Um, I think we can uh, rely on Wooden, for example, to be uh, recording the markings. I think he was using a template uh, of what a racehorse should look like, and then he just changed the color of the coat and changed the markings uh, to suit the needs of his particular uh, customer, client. Um, so in the early days, there probably aren't a good representation. But then when you look at the very first early pictures of Swallow and of Black Legs, uh, we see a very coarse uh, English uh, type of horse. Um, and over time, we start to see the Arab features creeping into uh, the, the portraits. So not perfectly accurate, but a good indication of what they look like. Thank you. Um, and then I've got another one here, which um, is, what are your thoughts on the de development of the British genre versus what was going on in France, i.e. with artists like Jericho, Delacroix, Degas at the time? Um, I was warned this question was coming up and uh, I haven't done a deep study, but I think um, 
I'd answer it by saying, if we look at uh, the pictures being produced by Emil Adam, uh, that we had artists in that late 19th century uh, looking to produce a good representation of the horse, uh, almost with a photographic accuracy. Uh, and I think Adam does a good job if that's his objective. I think if we look at the pictures by Degas and uh, the other French painters, they were trying to capture the mood of their painting school and were using uh, racehorses and racing scenes as ways of portraying uh, the horse. And it's not until we get to uh, Alfred Munnings that the Impressionist style uh, of painting starts to influence the portraits that we're getting in this country. Um, Tim, do you have a person who you, an artist who you think particularly well captures? Do you have a favourite? Uh, I suppose you've seen from uh, what I was, the examples I used that Stubbs uh, stands out as preeminent um, as offering me two things. One, a good representation of the horse, but also a good stories hidden within the pictures. Uh, and I suppose that's what I've uh, been attracted to. But I am waiting for Karen. Uh, I love working with uh, Richard Wills on the Seymour catalogue uh, because uh, his drawings being converted into paintings uh, was an interesting study. And I'm, as I said, waiting for Karen to produce um, her work on Wharton because I think we'll learn more about both painting, sporting art, and the development of the thoroughbred from what she, she finds out. How important do you think the landscape is behind the, the picture? It's obviously a useful research tool, but... Um, I think um, if uh, you look at uh, the Heath and the Horse, and it's here that I, I pay yet another tribute to David Aldry. Um, one of the things that we did in the Heath of the Horse was to identify where every painting was uh, painted on the Heath. Um, and we can see the changes in the geography. We can see uh, how the heath was looking. We know where the buildings were. We know how the buildings looked. So there is a lot of detail which we wouldn't get other than from these, these paintings. And how important was the development of photography? What significance did you see with that, with the development of portraiture then? Uh, um, I think... Um, uh, one sees accuracy. I, I suppose we've always said that the uh, the development of the work by Moybridge uh, in America, where he was photographing the galloping horse and can show how uh, the horses uh, uh, move it during the race, uh, gave a lie to the early portraits of galloping horses. Uh, it's a section that I cut out for time uh, reasons. But those uh, so-called uh, rocking horse paintings uh, where the, the back legs are planted on the ground and uh, the looks as though the, the, the horse is leaping forward. Uh, that was a convention that goes back to classical times as to way um, horses should be or could, were portrayed. I think everybody understood it to be a galloping horse. So it's not until Moybridge in photography that we, uh, and his work, that we get a proper understanding it through the artists of how get horses are galloping. Uh, so photography helps us there. Um, I think it's, uh, we're working with two different artistic uh, genre. Uh, a photograph is capturing something different that an artist is trying to portray. Um, so there is a difference, but uh, photography has informed the artist. Uh, I think the artist can inform the photographer as well. If anybody wants to ask a question, just to let you know, there's the Q&A button at the bottom. Uh, we forgot to say that at the very beginning, if anybody wants to. And if, if you don't, if you can't, if you want to email any questions for Tim, I will be very happy to forward them to Tim and we'll get back to you at a future time. 
Uh, is Caroline there? I am. Just, I think we're I, there. I yeah, no, I think um, that's all I have on questions for now. Okay. Well, thank, well, thank you. you very much, Caroline, for taking over my job as chairman. <laughs> much appreciated. Thank you very I much. Prefer to be chairman than talker. <laughs> Thank you very much, Tim, and uh, thank you very much for delivering a, a very informative and very interesting talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And just to let you, remind you, 27th of April is the next one, which is by Xavier Gray, who's from the, the director of the Wallace Collection, talking about uh, the dog exhibition currently at the Wallace Collection, which I can't remember the name of the title. It's something from Gainsborough to something else, but they... A portrait of dogs from Gainsborough to Hockney. That's right. Thanks, think, Caroline. <laughs> which is, and it finishes, I think, on the 15th of October. Yeah, so we, 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 what we're, we're doing, we're going to do the talk and then we'll arrange uh, a trip to the exhibition after the talk. Uh, and we'll let you know the date for that um, uh, fairly shortly. Okay, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you very much. Thanks. See you all soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.